We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Good morning, ACC. How are you guys? All right. Hey, whether you are joining us here in the auditorium, online, or in the lounge, it's just great to be with you guys. Can we welcome our guests? Can we just welcome them? Thank you so much for gathering with us this morning. And, you know, um, last week uh, there was a whole group who got back from Sierra Leone. And, and I don't have enough time to be able to talk about all the great things that God did while in Sierra Leone. But what I will say is this. Something like 550 thereabouts people uh, got some medical, much needed medical attention while over there. Over a thousand people heard the good news of Jesus and there was just a lot of great things. There was training for pastors and right now we have a team, a go team in Nicaragua that Pastor Matt, Pastor Mike um, and some other staff, uh, Melissa and Michelle and, and a lot of people are there and from what I understand, they had a VBS of 700 kids. 700 kids, yeah. And listen, if you're wanting to help this generation know about Jesus, we're going to have convention in a couple weeks. We need about 30 to 50 more uh, volunteers, at least 30. And so listen, if you've been on the sidelines, this is the time to get off the sideline, go up to the Next Steps counter, go online and register to help. And if you feel like you have nothing to give, I guarantee you, there is something that God wants to do in you so that he can do something through you, okay? We'll make certain that you're ready. Well, today we are continuing on in our series called Unshakables. We're talking about the unshakable things of the faith, but before we dive in to talk about scripture and how we got them, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we lift up our brothers and sisters, uh, this GO team in Nicaragua. We, we lift up the Sierra Leone church as well as the Nicaraguan church, asking, Father, that you would just sustain, that you would give energy. Father, that you would make your name known. And Father, we ask that you would work in our hearts and in our minds this morning. And Father, that you would download exactly what we need to hear from you from heaven this morning. We ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus our Lord. And everybody said... Amen. Well, you know, when we talk about scripture, um, I don't know about you, but I started following Jesus 29 years ago. And as I began following him, I had a lot of questions. I had questions about how we got the scriptures, how, why, why these books, why not this? And, and I think that at some point or another, we all ask questions that we don't know the answers to. And sometimes we feel like, am I allowed to ask that question? Well, listen, as we're talking about the unshakable things of the faith, yes, yes, this is a safe place to ask questions. And so you may not know what you believe yet. You may be exploring it, and we want you to know we're glad that you're here, and maybe you do know Jesus. And guess what? Again, you may have questions. We should be curious people. We should be inquisitive of these things. We should be constantly growing. And as we talk about the unshakable things of the faith, as we've talked about the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Today, we're going to be talking about the scriptures themselves. And so, as we come to this big idea statement, whether you're here or at home or in the lounge, I want to encourage you, read this with me. It says, we believe the Bible, the 66 books of the Old and New Testaments, to be inspired by God. It was written by human authors under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and is the source of truth for our lives today and every day. We hold that the scriptures in their original manuscripts are infallible and inerrant. They are the unique, full, and final authority on all matters of faith and practice. There are no other writings similarly inspired by God. Now, this is a faith statement that we have as a church, and we're not going to say that it's perfect, but we have tried to line it up with what the scriptures teach, what they say, and what we believe as a church. And when we talk about all these things, all these unshakables, 
at the end of the day, everything is going to be built on the Word of God. And so this message, I think it's exceedingly important. When we talk about canon, um, this is talking about, uh, as it were, a cane, a measuring rod, a rule of faith. So imagine this ruler, okay? And there are going to be things, books, letters, that are going to measure up and others that are not. Now, this morning we're going to talk about five um, principles that kind of led towards the formation of the canon. But I want you to understand first and foremost what a canon is, and that is it is a, a, a ruler, as it were. It's, it's these things measure up. If, if We're going to talk about five principles. If you only have four, it doesn't measure up. If you only have one, it doesn't measure up. And you know, since we have 4th of July coming up, I need you to know that, listen, we're not going to go by those centimeters. We're going to go by the inches, right? Because we're Americans, But within it, there's going to be things that are going to measure up, things that are not going to measure up. Now, when we talk about this, when we talk about the formation of the canon, of why these books are in the Bible and why some are not, because every once in a while we hear this thing of, oh, there was this lost book, or they're trying to keep it out. And I want to talk about, just very briefly, what four myths of the formation of the canon are. Very quickly. One of them that you hear very often is, Constantine, Emperor Constantine, decided the books of the Bible. False. That's a myth. He did not. Um, The only thing that he did is make Christianity a legal religion. Up until this point, the church had persecution. And in fact, just before Constantine, there was a lot of persecution going on. In fact, there's a story of uh, two deacons who, um, you have to understand, not every church had a Bible. Not every church had all the books of the Bible. In fact, there was a formation going on. And you have to understand also, uh, these things, they were hard to come by. You might have one church like this that had a portion of the Bible. So these deacons, they didn't necessarily have a Bible. They didn't have the books of the Bible. They didn't have the New Testament. But the question was, who has it? Tell us who in your church has this, or we're going to take their life. We're going to kill them. This was Rome. And the deacons were martyred in order that the word of God would be preserved. And stories like this abound through the centuries over and over and over again. In fact, this Bible, you see this? If you have a Bible, go ahead and lift that up for just a moment. Go ahead and take that. If you've got a phone, put it up because I know you can get the app. <laughs> if you don't have it, you can download it. But here's the thing. Just the materials to get these 66 books just the materials, not the time, not, the, not, not, not writing it down or anything like that. It would have cost nine to $10,000 in today's dollars for the materials. That's right. For, forget that used car. You're going to get a Bible. That's what you're going to get. You got, it's nine to $10,000 even without the work. And oftentimes at that time, if you wanted a Bible, you're going to probably have to write it out yourself. And I know some of you guys are really worried because I've seen your handwriting. That is not going to translate to the next generation. They'll be like, I'm not certain what they were trying to say. Thankfully, those who were writing the canon, those who were giving it on, they were faithful in that. Now, another myth of the formation of the canon was a council decided the books of the Bible. No, they did not decide. And we'll talk about that in a moment. A third myth is the Bible changed over time, that there was the telephone game. No, it didn't. And again, we'll speak to that more later. And finally, the fourth myth of the formation of the canon is the Bible was made to oppress people. No, actually, it liberated them. It liberated them. Now, are, those, there, are, those, are there those people who twisted the Scripture? Yes. Even in the New Testament, We're told that there are those who have twisted the scriptures to their own demise. Even in the first century, they were saying this. And so there are those who certainly tried to say things like, well, slavery, yes, God wants slavery. And that would be twisting the scriptures. But there were also those who were faithful who said, no, this is not God's will. And there were those who spoke from the pulpits, people who spoke from up at the stage and taught. People like William Wilberforce over in uh, England. You had people here in the States as well. And ultimately, we had a civil war and such. And guess what? 
Bad theology, it destroys people. It hurts people. So we need to know what God's word actually says. Now, when we talk about this, understand inspiration that the scriptures, inspiration by God is what gives the scriptures value. Let me say that again. Inspiration by God is what gives the scriptures value. Now, there is a particular basketball player that I will just say he is the greatest of all time. He is amazing, okay? And we got a picture of him up here. Yeah, that's right. LeBron who? So, the GOAT, Michael Jordan, amen? All right. So, six-time NBA champion, two three-peats. We had five NBA NBA. NBA MVPs, six NBA final MVPs, 14 NBA All-Stars. He had 32,292 points, 6,672 rebounds, that's right, kicking it down, 5,633 assists, and that was all done in just over 1,000, 1,072 games, and that is why he is the GOAT. Not to mention LeBron he wears 23. I mean, come on, it's kind of, he even acknowledges it to a degree. But anyway, the point is, when I look at Jordan, and you look at his career, nobody got together and said, okay, we're going to decide who the greatest is in basketball history. We're going to make that decision now. And so now, because people got together and decided that Michael was the GOAT, oh, now he's the greatest of all time. No. No, what happened is Michael played. Jordan played basketball, and he was a legend. He is a legend. And all that people have done is recognized what we already know. And some of you guys ought to know, amen? (laughs) But within this, I say this because it's similar when we look at Scripture. It's not that people got together and decided on the books of the Bible. Rather, it was they recognized what already was. They recognized the authority. They recognized what God was already doing. And so when we talk about the, fi- the formation of the can- canon, those things that measured up, we're going to talk about five principles for discovering canonicity that kind of led the people of God along the way. And if any one of these is missing, it didn't factor in. Now, the first thing that we see is the authority of a book. The first principle was the authority of a book. Is it inspired by God? Is it self-authenticating? Does it claim to be from God in some way, shape, or form? Now, it, you might see this in some words such as, thus saith the Lord, especially if you have a King James Bible this morning, right? So, thus saith the Lord. It claims to be from heaven. It claims to be from God. But again, remember, just because it claims to be from heaven, Just because it claims to be from God doesn't necessarily mean that it always is. And we'll get to that even more as we go on. The second principle for discovering canonicity that we see over time is the prophetic or apostolic authorship of a book. Was it written by a spokesman or someone associated with God's spokesman? Someone associated with God's spokesman. So for example, The Gospel of Luke. Luke was not an apostle, but he said, hey, listen, there's a lot of Gospels going around there, and I want to get a first-hand account. And so I went and I talked with different people, such as the apostles, and I was able to get that. The Gospel of Mark is Peter's Gospel written by Mark. We read in Hebrews 1.1, it says, Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. This morning, as we're going through these principles, I want to look and see what the scriptures actually say about the scriptures, because this is important. Again, in 2 Peter, it says, above all, you must realize that no prophecy or scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, they, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit, and they spoke from God. These are important principles, exceedingly important principles. And yet we also know that there will be false teachers. We're told many times in scriptures. In Jeremiah 14, 14, it says, Then the Lord said, These prophets are telling lies in my name. I did not send them or tell them to speak. I did not give them any messages. 
They prophesy of visions and revelations they have never seen or heard. They speak foolishness made up in their own lying hearts. Sarah, there are those who are going to claim to be from heaven. Those who, along the way, even in the Old Testament, there were those who were claiming, but they were lying. And God makes it clear. And it doesn't just stop in the Old Testament. We see this in 2 Thessalonians 2.2. Paul, an early follower of Jesus, he says, don't be easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them. Even if they claim to have had a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us. To the church in Galatia, in the book of Galatians, Paul even goes so far as to say, listen, whether I come to you with a different, if I even come to you with a different gospel or an angel from heaven, may they be cursed. There is no other gospel. And there were those who were trying to twist, turn, lie along the way. The third principle that we see for discovering canonicity was the authenticity of a book. That is, does it tell the truth? Is it orthodox? Is, does it line up with what we already know? What we already know. So think about in the time of Jesus, we have the Hebrew Bible, which we would refer to as the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. And so as we're looking at a new covenant in Christ, do these things line up? And there were questions along the way. We read in the book of Acts, Acts 17, 11, it says, And the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica, and they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. Does this line up with what we already know? Does this line up? And this is something that we should all ask, whether I'm up here teaching. By the way, my name's Pastor John. I'm one of the executive pastors here at ACC. Um, whether I'm teaching, or Pastor Matt, or Pastor Mac, or Pastor Mike, if anybody is teaching, we are not infallible. God's word alone is infallible. God's word alone is inerrant. This is what we build our life on. And if we say something that doesn't line up with God's word, then Listen, do us a favor. Let us know. Let us know. But bring the scriptures. Because if it's not scriptural, well, then it's an opinion. And we all have opinions, right? And that's okay. But within this, they searched. We also see, I love this story out of the, out of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 25 to 27. This is after Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. And Jesus is walking down the road, and these two people that he's with don't recognize that it's Jesus. And he says, it says that Jesus said, he said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. This is amazing. I love the fact that when, we, when you read the New Testament, you can't not read the Old Testament. It's been said the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Maybe you've heard that before. And I like to think, I like to, I wonder, all these Bible references to the Old Testament that we see in the New Testament, how many of them, I wonder, how many of them did Jesus himself say, oh, what about this one, that one, this one, that one, this one, that one? And there are a lot. There are a lot. In fact, I have a picture to illustrate just how many references, how many cross-references there are between the Old Testament and the New Testament. If we could bring that up here. 63,779 cross-references exist. I know of no other book like this. In fact, I will go out and say there is no other book like this. 
You can see all the way over here from Genesis all the way over to Revelation. And when you look at the lines underneath, that's basically the longer it is, the more references there are going over there, back and forth, back and forth. You'll notice that there's smaller smaller ones here and there and here. And so what ends up happening is that in the Old Testament, the Old Testament refers to the Old Testament. The New Testament is also referring there and back and forth and back and forth. And so there's even like, for example, in the days of Gideon, in the book of Judges, it makes references back to the time of Moses to say, hey, listen, Gideon is kind of like a little Moses. He's going to liberate the people of God. And then you go over here to one of the gospels, and it makes this small statement that actually refers to a town that Gideon was in at that time, in essence saying the Messiah, Jesus, as he comes in the world, he's going to be like Gideon, who was like Moses. He's going to liberate his people. 63,779 cross-references. The authenticity of a book. Does it line up with what we already know? So when we say, is it biblical? Oh man, these are questions. These are questions that the people of God had to ask. And I would say, based on looking at this, man, they were so faithful to make certain that things lined up. The fourth principle for discovering canonicity that we see is the dynamic nature of a book. Is it life-transforming? Does it have the ability to bring about transformation in a person's life? And you know, here at ACC, you know, we want to see people transformed and released by the love of Jesus. And that is exactly what the scriptures do in their fullness. We see in scripture, we see 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. We're told by Paul, all scripture is God breathe and is used for, for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now let's be honest. When we see those words rebuking and correcting, I don't know about y'all, but I'm not huge on those always. I'm not huge on that. But we also see in Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our inner thoughts and desires. It's less that we read the scripture and it's more that the scriptures read us. 1 Peter 2 says, so get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. When our team was in Sierra Leone, uh, we were talking about household codes in the book of Colossians and throughout the New Testament. And this is basically like, uh, think about your household. This is what's required of, of a man. Here's what's required of a woman. Here's what's required. And, and within it, we looked, and it was very interesting because it said things to women, but it was a whole lot less than what it was saying to the men. And it was, there was a lot of the same things. But when it came to men, it was saying, you know, listen, old men teach young men. Husbands, treat your wives like this. Cherish them. Be kind to them. Don't be harsh with them. Care for them as you would care for your own body. Do all these things. In fact, come alongside the young men and teach them self-control. I mean, it was, there was a lot there. And in the midst of this, I had a pastor in the class. And he suddenly says, in his own dialect, he, sa he, he says something. And, and I had a few librarian students over here. And they said, what did he say? And I'm like, I don't know. And he says, 
I feel convicted. What do you mean you feel convicted? I feel convicted. As we're reading all of this, I don't line up with what God is saying. I feel convicted. I need to treat my wife differently than I do at present. And I saw a spirit of repentance in his heart. I saw that he was being challenged by God's word to come into conformity to what God himself is saying. We want God's best, but sometimes, sometimes we read and we're like, you know what, I don't know if I agree with that. I don't know if I like that either. Like, for instance, I've had men, when I talk about these things, uh, the women section, one of the things that it says is, if we are not treating our wives the way that we're supposed to, it says that God's not going to hear our prayers. What? What do you mean God's not going to hear my prayers? Yes, God is going to be like Michael Jordan. He's going to take that ball. He's going to hit it down. Some of y'all are having flashbacks to some, that's right. But within it, understand, it's not that God doesn't want to hear our prayers. It's simply, your actions are so loud, I can't hear your words. And he was hearing this very clearly. And it challenged all of us, myself included. We need to cry out for this nourishment. We've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And and for some of you, you're asking questions, and that's a good thing, because sometimes you look and you go, listen, I love your Jesus, but your people, the church, don't always look like him. I read what you're supposed to be like. Am I missing something? I read the book of Acts and I thought that you guys were supposed to love for one another, pray for one another, outdo each other in kindness. I've had some experiences. Maybe you've had some experiences. And sometimes, sometimes there's some friendly fire along the way. And so we just need to conform our, our lives. We need to submit our lives to God's word to say, hey, listen, I don't know everything, but I know the one in heaven who does. Amen. But within this, as we are taking the ruler, as we, are, as we are trying to measure and make certain that, listen, there's canonicity, we've hit four of them. We've hit four. And as we look at these four up here, go ahead and bring that up. As we look at these four principles for discovering the canonicity, if we have the authority of a book, the prophetic or apostolic authorship of a book, the authenticity of a book, the dynamic nature of a book, we may have all of these things. But there's still one left. And if this one is missing, none of the others matter. There are times that that the scriptures actually refer to other books. In the book of Jude, it refers to the ascension of Moses, but it doesn't make it in. When we go to the book of Acts, Paul quotes some of the Greek poetry, but it doesn't make it in. We know that there were other books along the way, but they didn't make it in. And even if they had all these others along the way, this fifth one matters. It matters just as much as the other four, and that is the acceptance of a book. Do the people of God accept this book? Do people with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, are they accepting of this book. Relaying a message matters. It truly does matter. And when I think about this, I think about how, you know, sometimes people want to say that, well, we can't really trust the the relaying of the message. Sometimes we can't really know what somebody really thinks or believes. For example, you have a phone. How many times, how many times have we sent a message. You sent a message to someone and it didn't come across the way that it was meant to. Or they sent one to you. Maybe, maybe it was a few years ago, but a well-meaning, loving, older grandma, grandpa 
You told them a tragic story, and they, all they wanted to do was comfort you. And so they sent you back a text, and they're tech savvy. And so they sent back, LOL, lots of love. <laughs> and you went, Grandma, I don't think that means what you think it means. Or they're really excited, and so they do all caps. And lots and lots of explanation points because they're so excited. They, they have this exuberance and you're like, why are you yelling at me? Why are you yelling at me? Or maybe it's a friend who they do know how to use these things and, and they spoke, but it didn't come across the way that it was meant to or you tried to and it didn't come across. Let's just be honest. Let's just, let's just acknowledge texting sucks, right? Don't let that be the only thing that you get out of this entire morning, Okay. At the same point in time, if I needed to give a message to you and I said, hey, tell my wife, Megan, that I'll be home at 5 o'clock and, I'll bring, and I'm going to bring ice cream, can you give that message to my wife? I think that you can give that message to my wife. I think that we can be reliable. And it's important to understand that in this world there is reliability, but how much more with God? Because as Christian apologist Jim Walton says, if we cannot trust God to relay his message accurately, we have no basis for a relationship with him. And I would go even further and say, and so we are still lost in our sin. But if God sent his son to die on our behalf, do you think he'd want to make certain that we knew? Do you think that he would want to make certain that we got the address right? Bring up that cross-reference picture again, please. This is God making certain that we recognized his hand in there. When we talk about the scriptures, when we talk about this, the unshakableness of the truth of the scriptures, you know, when we talk about some of the additional evidences, and keep this up there as I'm talking about this, there are things, you know, first and foremost, what wasn't removed? When we look at this, there are things that were not removed that, man, it would have been so easy to remove things. To remove things like Mary Magdalene being the first to see the resurrected Jesus. Not only was she demon-possessed, not only did she, was she a prostitute, but in addition to that, in antiquity at that time, the witness of a woman wasn't admissible in court. It was the same thing with shepherds. They would not listen to them in a court. And yet, God uses the foolish things of this world and these people were not foolish in any way, shape, or form. They were faithful. You had the shepherds at his birth, and you had a woman at his resurrection. And God said, I can use people. I can use people like you and like me who are faithful, who say, I'm not going to listen to what everybody else is saying. I'm going to listen to what you say, God. Prophecies, the amount of, this is, this is more evidence, the prophecies given. There's a, a physicist, he figured this out early on. He looked at the numbers and he said, for all the prophecies of Scripture that had been fulfilled, and there are still some yet to come, it is a one in ten to the one thousandth power chance. Now, I don't know about you guys, I did not do so well in math in school, so I needed this break, broke down just a little bit more, okay? So we got lotto numbers, okay? <laughs> when you take those numbers, he says... It would be like going out tonight, finding 125 different lottos across the country, across the world, and you go out and you buy one ticket for each and every single one of those lottos, all 125 lottos, and tomorrow you wake up to find out you struck it big 125 times. 125 lottos, all won on the same night, one ticket each for those prophecies to be fulfilled. And they have been. They have been fulfilled. And there are some that still have yet to be fulfilled, which we look forward to, like Jesus coming back. He's gone to prepare a place for us. The third additional evidence is the archaeological evidence. There are things outside of the Bible, though the Bible is enough there are things outside of the Bible that basically say, hey, listen. 
I'm going to talk, I'm, I'm going to leave evidences that point to the Bible. So for existence, for example, you may have heard the story of Balaam, son of Beor. This was a false prophet that was hired to curse Israel. And every time that he was supposed to curse Israel, he blessed Israel. Every single time, over and over and over again. We read about that in the scriptures. We read that in God's word. But then we discovered a thing called the Dare Allah inscription. It's outside the scriptures. And it actually refers to Balaam, son of Beor. We have these things. And so, so, so many more. We can go to the places that talks about. We can see the things. And when people say, no, 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 I don't know that that's reliable. So, for example, the additional evidence, consistent transmission. There were people 100 years ago who would say, listen, the transmission of the gospel would be like the telephone, the telephone game. It's not reliable. You start here, and by the time you get over there, it's completely different. And the oldest manuscript at that time that we had of the entire Bible was the Leningrad Codex from a thousand years ago, a thousand years after Jesus. And then they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls that predate Jesus by about 60 to 90 years, give or take. And they took portions like the Isaiah Scroll. They had the whole thing. They took all these scriptures. They took the Isaiah Scroll next to the Leningrad Codex and they went, they're the same. They're not different. They haven't changed over the years. The transmission of the words of God have been transmitted from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next, faithfully through the centuries. We find things, we find things like fragments of the gospel of John, a fragment in 90 AD, from 90 AD. Not even a hundred years. And it's probably not the original autograph, but we have portions. And so we know that we can trust what is in here because God has preserved his word. This is something that is so unshakable because we build our entire faith on it. If the foundations be rotten, how are we going to build on it? And yet God, God has preserved the foundations of the faith. So what now, God? We ask this each week. The first thing that I would say is we need to thank God. When is the last time, if ever, that you've thanked God for his word? Think about it. Many of you have 5, 10, 15, 20. You have an entire collection of Bibles. And let's just be honest, we struggle to read one. You have Bibles, and you've never even read the entire Bible, let alone just the New Testament. Make that a goal now now because there are people in antiquity who would have been going wait a minute you have the words of you have the words of life you have God's word and you don't it's not convenient it's it's, you don't have the time I don't understand why would you not want to hear from the God of heaven so dig in daily live it daily don't just dig in live it daily Hide it in your heart. I hear people over the years, they say, do you think that, do you think that the apocalypse, do you think that the Antichrist is coming? Do you think that, you know, it's the end? Listen, if you're that concerned, then start memorizing scripture. Start sharing the good news of the gospel that brings freedom. Bring it because people are longing for it everywhere. And the last two, listen, I don't know where you are know where you are. Maybe you've walked in here and you're like, John, this is the first time I'm hearing any of this and I'm just trying to figure this out. I want to ask you, if this is true, if this is true, what are you being asked to do? What is your next step? Don't let the day go without putting faith in Christ, without getting baptized, without whatever that is, without asking the questions. It can not wait. And finally, who do you need to share this message with this week? Because truth can be known. 
truth is a person. It's the person of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you that you had preserved your word and that you had entrusted it to us. And Father, we ask that you would help us to plant this, get roots deep into our hearts, and that it would come out in our hands and in our thoughts and all that we do. Help us to be a faithful people. You've given this to us, and Lord, it is measured up everywhere along the way. And even though we don't measure up in Christ, in Christ, we are seated in Christ, and we measure up because when you look at us, you see your son, Jesus. May we walk with him each day. And Father, may we share these unshakable truths to our neighbors, to our friends, to our coworkers, to our family, especially especially when it's not convenient or comfortable. We ask in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord. And everyone said, amen. Wow, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.